Well, turn in your Bibles to the book of Numbers, chapter 13 tonight. Hallelujah. You said, Brother Dan, that sounds familiar. It should. We were there a couple weeks ago. Numbers, chapter 13. We didn't finish. Actually, we didn't even start good. Hallelujah. So we're going to get started tonight. Praise the Lord. How many know that from time to time, you need a friend? From time to time, you need someone who will actually go with you on the journey. You know, it's good to be strong in the Lord. It's good to be able to do great and mighty things. But every now and then, you need a brother or a sister in the Lord to team up with you. Oh, yeah. Say, what do you mean, Brother Dan? Well, Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. He never sent them alone. He sent them as two. Guess what? There is no lone rangers in God. No lone rangers in God. Well, you know, me and Jesus got our own thing going. No, you don't. He set the pattern and he set it that way on purpose so that we would understand we need each other. Uh Uh-oh. You need your brothers and you need your sisters in the Lord. Amen. Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And he said unto them, Get you up this way southward. Go up into the mountain. See the land, what it is. And the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak or few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in. Whether it be good or bad. And what cities they be that they dwell in. Whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is whether it be fat or few, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. Father, we ask for your unction tonight. We ask, Father, that you would give unto us our daily bread. Yes, Lord, we ask that you would open the word tonight and that you would feed us out of your word, that that we spiritually have need of. For there is much, Lord, that we have missed. So tonight, open our eyes of our understanding and open up our our hearts, Lord, that we may hear the word of God as you mean it. Father, give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. In Jesus' name, amen Amen. and amen. amen. You may be seated. You notice in verse 18, he says, and see the land, what it is. Verse 19, and what the land is that they dwell in. Wait a minute, didn't he just say that? Go see the land, what it is, and what the land is that they dwell in. And then in verse 20, and what the land is. I think we missed something. The last time we were together, we talked about the importance of knowing your enemy. Anybody remember that message? That was two weeks ago tonight. Knowing your enemy. It is important. It is vital that you know your enemy. I am not your enemy. Your brother and sister is not your enemy. Another human being is not your enemy. Now, they may be the avenue that the enemy comes through, but they're still not your enemy. You need to know your enemy. So he sent them into the land, and he told them, go and see what kind of people are there. Are they strong or are they weak? Are they many or are they few? We went over all this. So it's important to know your enemy. Anybody been checking that out? He also said it's important to understand the land. Is it good land or bad land? You know you can be in a bad land. If you're in the wrong church, you're in a bad land. If you're in a church that doesn't teach the undefiled Word of God, you're in a bad land. If you're in a church that only preaches to you the doctrine of their organization, you're in a bad land. It's important to know the land you're in. Is it a good land or is it a bad land? Is it a land that's fat or is it lean? Amen. Why? Because if it's a fat land, you can get fat. If it's a fat land, you can grow. But you see, if you're a part of a church that's lean, you're not growing. Instead, they're taking the meat off your bones. Uh Uh-oh, I actually said that. So we're supposed to know our 
supposed to know where God has put us. Is this a good land or a bad land? Is it fat or is it lean? And is the wood there? In other words, can we build on it? Is there supplies so we can build and do what God has called us to do? You know it's important to be in the right place where you can grow? Yes, amen. Because if you're in the wrong place, even though everything seems wonderful, you may not grow. You may just sit there. Oh, we got the best worship. You know, over there at Church XYZ, we just got the best worship team. They just know how to worship. And our pastor can really preach, but you ain't growing. You can have the best and still be wrong. You can be in the wrong place, even though everything looks good. So it's important to know the land. Is it a land that is good or bad? Is it fat or is it lean? Is there wood so you can build? In other words, can I prosper in this land? Before you set roots in a place, you need to check it out. Can I grow here? Is this the place that I can actually seek God and I can flourish? Mm. Okay. We also talked about the cities. Are they strongholds or are they tents? In other words, are they nomads or are they set in? We talked about, and I'm not going to go back into this, I'm just going to say it really quick. We talked about there are some devils that have planted roots. They've been here for the long haul, and you've been battling them year after year after year after year. And then there's some other devils that just come along for the ride. Oh, wait a minute. There's some people that do that too. Oh, yeah. There are people that have come along for the ride. They'll jump on. The train, when, a, when the train's moving. In other words, when there's a move of God, people all of a sudden show up and jump on. They want to partake of your ride. They didn't do anything to partake, but they want to partake. But there's also devils like that. Devils come along and just jump on for the ride. Oh boy. I ain't going there. God help me, I'll get stuck on that again tonight. So it's important to know, is your enemy fortified? Has he took root and fortified himself? Has he made a fortress which is, looks like it's impossible to defeat? Or is it just a tent? Is it something that can be easily blown over? And I think I said last time that the majority of our enemies live in tents. The majority of our enemies are weak. They're lean. They have no roots. And the reason for that is because the church has not been a threat to the enemy. Because of no threat, the enemy can put the weak to deal with the church, folks. Oh, boy. It's a bad day when the devil sends his weakest devils to deal with us. Amen. It's a bad day when the devil feels like he can send the imps, the lowest form of demonic activity, to deal with the church. That's a bad day. You see, you should be such a threat to the enemy that he has to pull out all his weapons. Yes, yes. You should be such a threat to the enemy that he says, hey, it ain't going to work sending these little guys anymore. They're coming back wounded. Yes. They ain't even slowing them down. Oh. So, it, we talked about the land, we talked about the people, we talked about the cities, we talked about knowing your enemy. It is crucial. But notice in verse 20, and what the land is, whether it's fat or lean, whether there's wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit 
of the land. I find this very interesting that Moses had to tell them to be of good courage. Hear me now. This is the people of God. This is the people that were just brought out of Egypt. They saw miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. God went through plague after plague after plague to get them out of Egypt and to show His greatness. And then He took them to the Red Sea on purpose. You better know God's going to set you up. I told you He set you up. He's going to set you up and He's going to do it on purpose because He wants to reveal He's God. The day of weak church is over. Oh boy. I said the day of weak church is over. Why? Because we're entering a new day. We're entering a new time. And if you're weak, I feel sorry for you. You better learn to grow up. You better learn to grow up quick. I'm telling you now, because warfare is about to happen. Yes. Amen. Why? Because God has sent us into the land. Amen. That's right. Oh, really God. He put us right in the heart of Yenazu City, and He said, it's yours, go take it. Amen. Amen. Oh, wait a minute. He set you right in the heart of your family. He said, it's yours, go take it. Warfare. Yeah. Oh, let's go on. Be of good courage. Not just have courage. But have good courage. Okay, now wait a minute. It's one thing to have courage. And it's another thing to have good courage. There is a difference. Do you know that the church has learned how to Build themselves up. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. In other words, we've learned how to pump ourselves up or build ourselves up so we can have courage. Yes. Uh -huh. He's not talking about that kind of courage. <laughs> That's where you work for it. He said, have good courage. Amen. Good courage, you don't build up. Uh -huh. Oh, boy. Be a Good courage. Courage means to have a mental or moral strength to resist opposition, danger, or hardship. Good courage means you're ready for it. Uh-oh. Let's go on. Courage implies a firmness of mind in the face of danger or extreme difficulty. How many got courage? You've got a, a firmness of mind knowing there's danger right about the corner, but you've still got a firmness in mind. Amen. Amen. I told you God set you up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Courage suggests an ingrained capacity for meeting a strain or a difficulty with fortitude and resilience. Boy, that's a mouthful. I'm going to say it again. Yes. Courage suggests. It's just a suggestion. Courage suggests an ingrained capacity for meeting a strain or a difficulty with fortitude and resilience. Anybody know what that means? It means you're going to stand. Amen. It means it doesn't matter how good it is, how bad it is, you're standing and you're standing on the Word of God. Amen. I don't care what it looks like. I'm going to stand. Right. Oh, Brother Dan, you don't know what I've been through. You just don't know what the devil's been throwing at me. You know, I just, it's all I can do. Stand up right now. Oh, come on. That's not good courage. That's right. I'm going to step on you and I'm going to step on your heart tonight. That's right. 
Because God set you up and He set you up on purpose. Because you've got to have good courage, not courage. It's not about building yourself up. It's, get, it's about getting rooted in a firm position in God that it doesn't matter what comes your way, you're not going to be moved. Amen. That's good courage. Courage is also defined as the ability to do something brave out of a motivation of the heart, not the mind. In other words, you didn't pump yourself up, you didn't build yourself up mentally so you could be strong and do it. It came straight out of your innermost being. That's good courage. Good courage means living out of the inner confidence in the God that you serve and that it is spirit produced. You don't produce this kind of courage. It comes from God. So Moses told them, have God's courage in you. <laughs> have God's courage inside of you. In other words, is God afraid of the enemy? No. Not even a hint. I don't care what the devil throws at the church. God's not afraid of it. By the way, God already knew what was going to happen to you. He knew what was going to happen in your life. He knew all the junk that was going to come your way. And he said, you can handle it. Right. Yeah. Uh-oh. Brother Dan, it's so hard. He didn't say it wouldn't be hard. He said you can handle it. That's right. He said, have good courage. You can overcome this. Yes. <laughs> Good courage refers to God empowering the believer with a bold inner attitude. Oh, wait a minute. So when they took the disciples, Peter and John, and they took them off to the side and they said, you will no longer speak in this name. We won't allow it. You can't speak in that name any longer. And what did Peter and John do? They took good courage. Good courage. They were excited. Why? Because they're trying to tell them they can't speak about their God. Good courage rises up in the face of adversity. Good courage. Good courage. When all hell breaks out against you, that's when you find out if you got courage. Uh oh. Oh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, what is the purpose of good courage? Why would Moses tell them, have good courage? Well, let's look on. It was not only, well, let's read it. And be your good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Bring of the fruit of the land. It wasn't just to have courage to go in the land. Oh. It takes a little bit of courage to go up against the enemy. It takes some faith. To say, I know where I'm going, and I know the enemy's not going to like it when I get there, but I'm going anyway, because my God said it's mine. My home is mine. My child is mine. My children are mine. My grandchildren are mine. My church is mine. My community is mine. Oh, I'm going to go. It takes courage to go into the land. Hear me now. It takes courage to go where you know the enemy is at. When you know that if I go there, all hell's about to break loose. You start believing God for your family. You believe God for your family to get saved. You watch what happens. All hell breaks loose. Yes. You start believing God to change things on your job. You watch. Here comes the heat. 
You better get ready. The enemy's going to put on the heat. You start believing for a miracle in your body and the enemy starts putting it on and you start feeling pain you didn't even know you had. So he said, be of good courage so you can not only go in the land, not only go where your miracle is, not only go where God has promised you, but you can bring back fruit. It's not enough to go in the land. you got to bring something back out of the land. You see, you go to your home and they, there's unbelievers there. How many of you bring it out? He's looking for fruit. He's looking for you to go into the enemy's territory and bring back something to show you've been there. I ain't talking about scars either. That's right. Oh, you want to see my battle scars? People want to talk about what they've done and how much the devil's been attacking them and fighting them. I can care less. Show me some fruit. Amen. Show me something that came out of you going into the enemy's territory. Show me something that you actually went in there knowing you were sent by God and you wasn't coming out without it. Oh boy. I told you he set you up. Fruit is a reward. An increase or to be fruitful. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to go into the enemy's territory, I'm coming back with some reward. Yeah. I'm coming back with some, some uh, uh, what's the old word? Booty. Yes. The spoils. The old, uh, 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 what's the, the uh, well, <laughs> the pirate's word is booty. Yes. I'm trying to say the pirate. They would bring back the treasures of the land. Amen. Why? If I'm going into the enemy's territory, I want to come back with the treasure. That's right. I want to come back with something to show I went there. That's it. Moses didn't say, just go look at it. Bring back fruit. It also means a result or reward that comes from taking some action or doing some activity. Oh, wait a minute. In other words, if I pray, there should be a fruit. Yes. If I'm believing the word of God, there should be a corresponding fruit. God should be doing something inside of my life that will show outwardly that I have been with Jesus. Oh boy. Moses told the spies, go check out the promised land. That in itself is enough. It's promised. But go check out the promised land and bring back to him a corresponding reward or action better known as fruit. Now whether you know it or not, Moses is symbolic of God. God gave them the promised land and he put a man over them to re represent him. So Moses was a representation of God who said, I give you the promised land, now go take it. Go spy it out and bring me back some fruit. In other words, God is speaking to the church today and he's saying unto you, of going and talking about it is not enough. I want some fruit. You can talk all day. Talk is cheap. You know what I'm talking about. We've been around people who can talk a good talk. They can talk about the power of God. They can talk about the miracles of old. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, back in Mama's day, God would come in and he would move. And he would shake the church. And everybody would fall on their face before God. And miracles would begin to happen. Where's yours? I'm thankful for Mama's Day. 
But I can't live off Mama's day. God gave me a promise. He gave you a promise. What you're doing with it. Still in Numbers 13. Number 13. Verse 23. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol. And they cut down from there a branch. Everybody say branch. branch. With one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two. Upon a staff. Wow. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. And the place was called the brook Eshcol. Because of the cluster of grapes with the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. Wait a minute. Yes. Yes. It took two people. One cluster. Yes. Wow. How awesome. Uh -huh. Anybody been to the store lately? Anybody get some grapes? You get a cluster of grapes? How many go to the store and buy one grape? How many go to the store and only get one grape? Nobody. You're going to get at least a cluster. But notice the scripture said they had to cut this cluster down. If you want what God has, you're going to have to reach for it. The blessings of God are within reach, but you've got to reach up for them. He's not just going to bring them down and put them in your lap. They had to go, and they had to reach, and they had to cut them down. But notice, the Bible says, they bear it between two upon a staff. I just wonder if one could even pick it up. I honestly believe that one person couldn't handle one cluster of grace. Oh, I'm headed somewhere. I believe that God sent them out the way he did on purpose so they would learn to realize you ain't doing this by yourself. You ain't going to do this by yourself, Brother Max. It's going to take a helper. You're going to have to have somebody else to carry what God's going to give you. Oh, you ain't got it yet. What you don't understand is what God has promised you, you can't handle it. What God has promised to do for you, you cannot take it and handle it by yourself. It's going to take some helpers to handle the promises of God. It's going to take somebody to come alongside of you and help pick it up and carry the load. wonder why the church has been the way it's been. We've been trying to do it by ourselves. That's right. Yes. That is right. That's right. You can't do it by yourself. Yes. Oh, I'm telling you right now, you, you get a glimpse of the blessings. We start dancing, we start shouting, we start having a good time just from a glimpse of the blessing, but we don't bring it home. We shout all over the church because the Spirit of God moved and He's revealed some stuff to us, but we never took it home because we couldn't handle it by ourselves. You've got to find somebody to come alongside you. Yes. You better get ready for who God's going to team you up with. Yes. Oh, Brother Dan, I'm already ready. I've got this person picked out. <laughs> You don't get to pick your partner. That's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't get to pick who gets to help you carry the promise. Jesus, Jesus. He said 12 out. Thank you, Lord. 12 people that were handpicked. Mm -hmm. 12 people handpicked by Moses to go into the land as God chosen you. 
Has he handpicked you to be one of the people that are supposed to be going into Yazoo City? Supposed to be going and searching out this land, finding out about the enemy, finding out about uh, the, 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 whether they're strong or weak and whether they're bad or, or lean. Has he chosen you to look at the fortresses? And has he chosen you to be the bearer of fruit? Oh. You don't know what a blessing it is to get to carry the fruit to the body. Just imagine carrying one big cluster of grapes. So big that it takes two of you to carry it. And there's so many people that can eat off of one cluster. God is trying to raise up godly men and women in this day and in this hour who are willing to step up and say, I'm willing to carry it back, Lord. I'm willing to go into the enemy's camp and I'm willing to bring back of the treasures that you've been promising us. People will say, well, let them go for themselves. It doesn't work that way. God chooses you to be a spy. He chooses you to be a spy. He chooses you to go into the enemy's camp. He chose you to go into the enemy's camp. And he chose you to go in with good courage and come back with the fruits thereof. Why would God send 12 men into this land for 40 days? They didn't just go in and come right back. They were there for 40 days looking through the land. Something about that number 40, isn't it? Send them in there for 40 days to search through the land and to look at all of the territory. You know why? Because you can't search your land in a day. Uh-oh. You cannot look at what God has given you in one day. It's going to take a whole lot more than one day to find out what my God's given you. If you're not careful, You'll step into the land and you'll see the first thing and you'll run back. Oh, there's some treasure over there. And you'll miss everything he had for you. Because you only saw one thing. The church has been doing this for years. There's a group that has settled for nothing but salvation. Don't get me wrong. It starts there. You've got to have salvation or else you ain't progressing in the kingdom. But there's a church that is totally settled for just salvation when God has so much more. There's another group that's settled for the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And that's all well and good. Hey, how many enjoy that? But God has so much more for you. Ooh. You've got to be willing to search out the enemy's camp to know what God has in store for you. In other words, there are things that you have taken a blind eye to. There are things that you have closed the door on because you don't want to look at it because it's the enemy. The promised land was inhabited by the enemy. How did they get there? After all, it's the promised land. I believe that God had established that land for the children of Israel before time began. So there were inhabitants, oh, I said it this morning, there were squatters in the land. There were people who didn't belong in this land. I had a dream about a month ago. I ain't going to tell you the dream for the sake of time. But I'm going to tell you this, that I saw myself walking around with a man. I never saw his face. Anybody know the faceless man? He's showing me a a uh, building of some sort, looked like an apartment complex, that was being changed into a motel. 
And he took me around and showed me all around. And when it was all said and done, he brought me back to my room. I he put my stuff in my room. But he didn't take me to my room. He took me to somebody else's room. Now, I don't know about you, but I know the Holy Ghost knows all things. Yeah. <laughs> Even in a dream, he knows all things. And he took me to somebody else's room, and he opened the door, and he burst up in the room. I mean, quick. He wasn't playing around. And there was a woman there with her back to the door, and she had a young child. And he ran over, and he grabbed the woman, and he took her over to a hole in the wall and threw her through the wall. And he said, get that kid and do the same thing. <laughs> and I said, where are they going? He said, back where they belong. Yeah. I went over and I looked out the hole and it was a chute. Straight down. Oh, wow. Went out of sight. He said, I said, go get the child and throw him through. Yeah. And I said, but What's going to happen to them? He said, they're going where they belong. They are squatters in your land. I've been carrying that for a month waiting to get to this message. Because I knew there are squatters in Yazoo City. There are squatters in your home that don't belong there. Uh-oh. You need to hear me. They are squatters that have taken up residence in your house. In your place or territory that God has given unto you. Notice, if you will, in my dream, he grabbed the woman and threw her. In other words, see, he gave me the interpretation right away. In other words, those that it looks like I can't handle, He'll take care of. But the ones I can handle, he expects me to do something about it. <laughs> Woo. you got to be willing to go in the enemy's territory because they have set up residence in your house. They've set up residence in this city. They have set up residence on your job. you got to be willing to go in. you got to be willing to go in and say, I'm taking back what's rightfully mine. Mm. So they returned. They went. And they returned with one cluster of grace. God didn't say bring the whole vineyard. This is really important. He's not telling you to go get the whole vineyard. Go get one. Just one cluster. Just one. And we've struggled to do that. The church has struggled to get one. Why? Because we really didn't believe it was ours. I'll go a step further. And we were afraid of the enemy. Hmm. When you get in the will of God, the blessings of God become greater and they're going to take more effort to handle. I'm going to say it again, because I don't think you got it. When you get in the will of God, the blessings of God become greater. Yes. And it's going to take a whole lot more effort to handle than what you've been doing here too far. Yes. I've been enjoying the blessings of God, but guess what? He's letting me know I can't handle what's coming by myself. I can't handle 200 by myself. Right. Neither can you. Right. That's right. Children's workers, can you handle 200 right now? Yeah. No. You're going to need some help. Right. You're going to need some people to come alongside and to help you carry the load. Yes, amen. Same with the youth. Amen. Better get ready. God wants to bless you so much that you have to seek help. Amen. Yes. God wants to bless you. Say, God wants to. God wants to. 
bless me. So much that I can't handle it. And I gotta have help to handle it. Yes. God is the God of abundance. My God is not the God of a few blessings. My God is not the God of a few dollars. He's trying to appease you. He's trying to buy you off. He's trying to get you to see that all things are His and He's giving you a promised land. Numbers 13, verse 26. And they went, who? The twelve spies. And they came to Moses. They went and they came. Put yourself right there. I went and I came. Oh, wait a minute. Do it again. I went and I came unto God to show him what I found there. Woo! You do still don't understand what you're saying. Because now you get to go into promised land. And you get to go and see what God has for you. But not only see it, you get to start grabbing it and bring it back. Yes. But wait a minute. I don't see them sneaking. Mm -hmm. The devil doesn't see me. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. That's the attitude of the church. As long as the devil doesn't see me, you know, I, I, I'm afraid of the devil. Really? Mm -hmm. You have no right going into the promised land then. You might as well stay home. Yeah. Stay home. You ain't ready for this. You're at war. I said, you're at war. The devil knows his days is numbered. Oh, if you only understood what that meant. The devil knows that he has taken the, 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 the promises of God for too long and his days are numbered because God is raising up a people who are not going to sit at home any longer. They're not going to sit back and let the devil have what's there. They're going in the promised land and get it. He knows. The days of keeping you addicted to something is over. Oh, you need to be I don't have to be addicted anymore. I'm set free. The days of being afraid of what the devil might do is over. And they went and they came to Moses and to Aaron. Wait a minute. Moses, symbolic of God. Eric was the spokesman. So they came to God and they came to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> they came and they stood before the representative of God and his spokesman, God and the Holy Ghost, and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, say, that's me. That's me. Uh oh. Unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh. And they brought back word unto them and unto the congregation, and they showed them the fruit of the land. Woo. So they came, and they presented. What you don't know is, when you go in the enemy's camp, when you come out, you're coming before God. Whether you know it or not, you're coming out before God. And when you go on Facebook and say, oh, that's a tough land. When you go and start talking to your friends and you say, you know, I was just trying to believe God. I, I just, I just, you know, I couldn't do it. I believed in God for my miracle and I started believing and all hell broke out against me. You're still standing before God. That's right. By the way, the Holy Ghost is listening to you. He listens to every word you say. So they came and they brought back word unto Moses and Aaron and the congregation and they showed them the fruit of the land. God is waiting on you to come back with fruit. He's waiting on you to come back with a word and something to back it up. 
Wow. And they told him and said, We came unto the land with whither you sent us, and surely, wait a minute, why did they say surely? Surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit thereof. Do you know why they said surely? Because God told him he was sending them to a land that flowed with milk and honey. And so they had to come back and say, you know what? What God said, he's right. You know, when God spoke through Moses or he spoke through Aaron or he spoke and he said, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to take you to this promised land. And that land is going to flow with milk and honey. You know what? He meant what he said. <laughs> so they came back and they started sharing. They started talking about this land. That land, it flows with milk and honey. And look, these are the grapes. <laughs> these are the fruit thereof. They took two of us to carry it. Mm. Not only is the land good. Not only is the land good. I got news for you. Not only is Yazoo City good. Oh, yeah. It may not look good from your eyes. It may not look good from the perspective of what you've been looking at. But when they came back, they said, that land is a good land. And it flows with milk and honey. Yeah. God said, I give unto you Yezu City. I didn't ask for Yezu City. He said, I give you the keys to the city. It's yours. That means anywhere I go, it's mine. Guess what? That means it's yours. Yeah. Yeah. But you've got to realize it's a good land. Yes. Yeah. Amen. I used to look at Yazoo City as a place I didn't want to be. I come through and I left. I come in and I minister and I got out of town as quick as possible. Uh-oh. Everybody out there knows now. I'm just being honest. But one day in March, in March 2015, God spoke to me and he said, it's yours. I didn't ask for this land. Guess what? Children of Israel didn't ask for the promised land either. He said, I give it to you. I give it to you. I give it to you. And so they went in, and they come back, and they started telling them how good the land is. But not only is it good land, not only is it fertile land, not only is it a land that we can find trees and we can build on and we can actually see ourselves living in, but all oh, look at the fruit. There is milk and honey in this land. Milk and honey in this land. It flows. That means freely. There's no restriction. Uh oh. It is free flowing. It is overflowing or it is gushing forth. That's what that means. That land is gushing Hallelujah. with fruitfulness. Yes, New City, you are gushing with fruitfulness. Yes, yes, God sees in you, Yes, New City, yes. a fruitful land. Hallelujah. God sees right here in Yes, New City, a promised land. Amen. That's why there's a battle going. Because this land, Yazoo City, is flowing with milk and honey, even though the inhabitants don't even know it. <clears throat> Notice, the Bible doesn't tell us they fought to carry the cluster of grapes back. There is nothing in the Word to say that they snuck it back, or that they had to fight off the enemy to bring back the cluster of grapes. Nothing. Why? Because the inhabitants of the land knew this was normal. This wasn't something that was a, a haphazard thing or just a coincidence that this year we got the best grapes. 
It wasn't one of those cases that, that just happened to be a move of God right then. I got news for you. This is not just a haphazard thing. Yeah. Woo. And because of that, the inhabitants of the land lost sight of what they had. If you're not careful, church, you'll lose sight of what God has given you because you've been living in it. They didn't battle. They carried the fruit back. I can see them just coming around. Just, whoo, carry the fruit. Didn't say there was anybody holding the sword. Carry the fruit, bring it back for all to see. The land flowed with milk and honey. Milk is an unusual word for this scripture. Milk. Milk symbolizes a superior quality, a richness of taste, and nourishment. This land flows with milk and honey. It flows with superior quality. This land, oh, Yazoo City, flourishes with superior quality even if you don't see it. And there is nourishment right here in this land you haven't even tapped into. Yes. Ooh. That's right. Milk, superior quality, richness of taste, and nourishment. Honey represents sweetness. Mm. Notice the goodness of Israel is both nourishment God promised them nourishment, milk, and honey, sweetness. God wants to give you something that's going to help you grow as well as taste good. <laughs> How many like things that taste good? First Peter 2 and 2 puts it this way. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Desire what? The sincere milk of the word. How many want to grow? Amen. Well, then desire the sincere milk. Amen. Well, I thought we were supposed to be eating meat. That's right. He said desire the sincere milk. Why? Because that means you're desiring superior quality. You don't want stale bread. Right. Right. You don't want day-old food. Right. Anybody ever taste spoiled milk? I can tell milk that it's turning before most people can tell it. Yes. I'm very sensitive to milk because I was allergic to it as a baby. And so I can smell it and tell when it's just starting. Yes. And I won't drink it. Why? It's not superior quality. I'll throw it out. My wife won't let me, but I'll throw it out. <laughs> Because to everybody else in the house, it tastes okay. But God has promised you superior quality in the Word. Well, God, I don't know if you got that. I said He's promised you superior quality in the Word of God. You don't have to settle for leftovers. You don't have to settle for what you heard last year. That's right. You should be saying, God, I need more. Yes, I got to have more of your word. I got to have a deeper walk with you. Yes. Yes. I ain't satisfied with yesterday. I want nourishment and I want superior quality. Because that's what that word milk meant. Uh oh. Turn real quick and I'm going to try to wind this up even though I ain't halfway. Psalms 19. I don't even know how long I've been already. Close to an hour. Psalms 19. Beginning of verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. 
converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired of they than gold, yet in much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the honey cold. Some of you are looking like you've never heard that. We used to sing the word. You can sing all seven, eight, nine, ten. You need to start practicing singing the word Amen. of God. Yes. Amen. Notice the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are righteous and are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Amen. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Word of God. The Word of God is both milk and honey. The Word of God is nourishment, but also sweetness. Yes. You want to get fat? Get fat in the Word. Yes. You want to put some weight on? Get the Word of God. Become consumed with the Word of God, and you will grow because you'll be nourished, and you'll get the sweet Word of God. Amen. Well, what is sweet to you may not be sweet to somebody else. Because he said, the statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart, the commandments of the Lord are pure. Most people don't like the commandments of the Lord. But they're pure. They're pure, meaning you need them. You need the commandments of the Lord because they are so pure, they'll make you pure. Mm. But look, the fear of the Lord is clean. Clean. Anybody feel clean? You want to know if you're clean? You really want to know if you're clean? Yes. Check out the fear of the Lord. Yes. Do you really fear Him? You want to know if you fear Him? It's all embraced in your attitude. The way you come to church tells us if you fear the Lord. <coughs> The way you worship tells us if you fear the Lord. Look, Brother Dan, I just don't sing, so I just stand there. It's not an option. I don't know if you sing or not, because most of you are behind me, and I have that way on purpose. But if you aren't, if you aren't singing, you don't fear Him. Because the Bible says He inhabits the praise of His people. And He said, let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. He expects you to praise Him. He expects you to lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. He expects you to dance before the Lord with all your might. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye people. He said noise. So if you got to howl with the best of them, start howling. Hey, sometimes I howl and I know it. But I'm going to howl and if it's, if it's off key, it's off key. I'm still going to howl. Can I tell you something really quick? And I'm trying not to get sidetracked, but i got to tell you. I have always loved to praise God. I remember at five years old when I was prophesied over in a black church in Rockford, Illinois by the pastor of this black church and we were the only white folks there. <laughs> My grandfather was there. I think he was there to minister. I really don't remember. But I remember being prophesied over by the black pastor. And i got to tell you, from that day on, I was never the same. From that day on, I always loved to praise God. Our children need to praise Him. They need to praise Him with everything that's in them. And I used to, I grew 
grew up in, and Prof, Prophetess Sharon will be here. She can, she can actually uh, testify to this if she remembers it. But we used to go to her dad's church. We would drive over an hour to go to church. I said we used to drive over an hour. So those of you who are driving, I've already been there. I grew up that way. We would drive for at least an hour to go to church, and we would stay all hours of the night. And I loved to be as close to the front of the church as I could, and when the worship was going on, I was right there, and I was in it, and I would shout. Hear me now. I didn't sing. I was shouting with all my strength, and the veins in my neck would pop out. And I wouldn't be the only one. There'd be a group of us young people up there, and I'm talking little kids. How do I know we were little? Because at 12 years old, God healed my eyes right there in that church. I remember it like yesterday. An evangelist came through who's dead now. He turned his back on God, but he prayed for me, and I was instantly healed as a 12-year-old child. How do I know? Went back to the eye doctor because my dad said he didn't believe it. My dad didn't go to church at that time. And he said, I ain't taking the word of a man. You take that boy to the eye doctor. So my mom called the eye doctor and said, I got to bring the son in. And he said, is something wrong? And she said, no, we just got to have it looked at. And I got in there and he said, he took her, told her to go out of the room. And he said, I need to talk to you. Why are you here? <laughs> I said, I went to a, a revival. And the evangelist laid hands on me and God healed my eyes. 12 years old. Amen. And he says, well, that's interesting. And he checked my eyes. You know how they do. And he did everything he could possibly do to get me to not see. <laughs> and he got done and he says, I just don't understand it. Tell me again what happened. <laughs> and I told him again. And he said, let me check your eyes again. <laughs> and he checked my eyes a second time. <laughs> Almost called his name out. <laughs> he checked him again and he says, I don't understand this. And he called my mom in and he said, Tell me what happened. And she said, Did you ask him? And he, she, he said, Yes, but I want you to tell me. And she told him exactly the same thing. And he said, I don't understand it, but he has 20 20 vision. <laughs> and I had 20 20 vision until the day I started sinning. At the age of 16. You say 16. I was 16. I remember like yesterday. Why? Because the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is clean. And I feared him. I reverenced him. And because I reverenced him, he healed me. 12 year old little boy. I didn't know much about God. All I knew is if, God, if the Word said it, I believed it. Amen. But I feared Him enough that when I came to church, I didn't want to play games. I didn't come to church to be seen. And I loved to worship Him. And I would shout during the song service. It got to a point that one of the elders in the church Stopped him one day and he told him, he said, hold on, we got to do something. And there was like three or four of us right there. And he said, uh, you young men, you come up here. And he made us come up to the platform behind the pulpit, which I don't remember what the pulpit looked like. But he had us right there, right off to the side of it. And he said, y'all start singing again. He said, you boys stand right here and you just sing. You worship God. And we stood there right in front of everybody and our veins were just a popping. <laughs> Because we loved God. We didn't care what anybody thought. We didn't care what we looked like. We were worshiping God. Amen. Worshiping Him. It's more to be desired than much fine gold. If you ever get a glimpse of my God, it's not about the fruit. <laughs> It's not about the fruit, how big it is and how wonderful it is. Even though it's going to take more than you to carry it, it's not about that fruit. It's about trusting Him. Yes. Amen. 
It's about fearing the Lord and allowing God to do what He wants to do in you. By this time next year, you will not be able to see yourself the same. That's right. Woo. By this time next year, you're not going to recognize some of yourself. Wait a minute. He already said that for some of you six months ago. And a lot has happened in six months. But what's going to happen in a year? <laughs> By this time next year, some of you are going to be carrying some grapes. And you're going to be barely able to carry them. Amen. Hear me. But you don't have to wait till then. The question is, are you willing to go in against an enemy who is more bark? He's more bark than he is bite. The enemy cannot hurt you unless you let him. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stay with me. I want to go on, but we got to stop. Mm -hmm. The land is full of giants. The Amalekites are there. The Hittites, Hivites, Hivites. I'm going to call them parasites. They're there. And they're trying to keep you from entering your promised land. But they can only keep out those who are afraid of them. Because if you have the fear of the Lord... You'll trust God more than man. Yes. You will fear God more than man. Therefore, you will say, if he said it, I believe it, that settles it. The promises of God are yours. They are yes, and they are amen. Anybody got a promise tonight? Yes. Amen. The promises of God are yes, and they are amen. By the way, God says he knows you. Yes. He knows your name. Yes. I said he knows you yes. by name. Yes. Yes. And he has a future for you. Yes. He has a plan for your life to bless you and to prosper you. Brother Dan, it hasn't worked out so well for me right now. It's because you didn't believe it. You didn't believe the promise. Whew. But once you believe, all things change. Once you believe, He loves me. My God loves me so much that He's going to bless me and He's going to pour out an abundance upon me. How many believe that tonight? Amen. Bow your heads with me. Father, right now I thank you that you have spoken to us a rich word. You have spoken unto us, Father, that we can have more than we ever tasted before. We can know more of your presence. We can know more of your spirit. We can know more of your blessings than we've ever thought possible. but you're waiting on us. So, Father, tonight I ask that you move upon the hearts and the lives of every person in this place. And that, Lord, that no matter what they're going through, that you would stir them up right now. Stir them, Father, to the very core of their being that they couldn't leave here like they came. In Jesus' name. They cannot leave here like they came in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. For the match, run over there by Jason real quick. Hallelujah. You two join hands. Join hands. Start joining hands in twos. In twos. Start joining hands in twos. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Find you a partner. Grab, grab hands with somebody. Get hands with two of them. Doesn't matter, just two of them. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, hear me. 
You just got hands with a partner. You didn't get to pick your partner. Well, I should have moved you around. You didn't get to pick your partner. God picks your partner. You say, well, I picked my spouse. Really? You really think so? God picked mine. I was, I was engaged to marry somebody else. Uh-oh. And God said, that's the wrong person. Out of the picture. God picks your partner. So right now, you just joined hands with a partner. And here's what's going to happen. Say this. I, I join hands, join hands with, a with a helper that's going to help me carry the grace, carry the fruit that has been promised to me from God. I seek out this helper to help me do what God has called me to do. I will do it. I will experience the greatness of God. I will receive my promise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now give him a shout of praise. And we told each other that we would commit to pray for them. Yes. yes. Just a few weeks ago. Now, I don't know how well you're doing, but I'm going to encourage you, keep on doing it. Yes. Keep on doing it. Why? Because the enemy doesn't like it. Yes. That's right. When you keep lifting up your, your prayer partner, when you keep lifting them up and you keep lifting up their knees, the enemy gets a little bit worried. Why? Because you said, I'm going into the enemy's camp and I'm taking back what's mine. I'm going and I'm going to take it back. Oh, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Took back what he stole from me. Oh, I took back what he stole from me. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. He's under my feet. 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 Satan is under my feet. Oh, I to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. He's under my feet. 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 Satan is under my feet. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, I think it's been too long since we sang that. We forgot what it means to go get it. Amen. We forgot what it means to go get back what's ours. When the enemy comes knocking, just start dancing. Just start dancing. Say, you're under my feet. Put him where he belongs. Put him where he belongs. Amen. 